Welcome everyone to the Listening Test Item Writing Workshop with Dr. Elena Rossi from Lancaster University. My name is Paula Winky. I'm a professor in the Second Language Studies PhD program at Michigan State University. And we are proud to have Dr. Elena Rossi with us today to talk about listening test um, item writing. And this talk is being brought to you by the SLA Knowledge and Production Lab within the Second Language Studies PhD program at MSU and also by the English Language Testing Office within the English Language Center at Michigan State University as well. Um, we got to know Elena Rossi uh, as she was working with us. Uh, we developed a handbook, the Rutledge Handbook of Second Language Acquisition and Language Testing at Michigan State University in coordination with Tina Brunfeld at Lancaster University. And Elena wrote a um, significant chapter on choosing test formats and task types for the handbook. And it's through that work that we got really interested in what she was doing on uh, test uh, task types and test formats and item writing. And of course, at the same time, the article in Language Assessment Quarterly was being finalized. So with those two different publications, uh, we sent everyone yesterday, if you were registered by yesterday, a copy of the LAQ article. Um, so we want to focus on that today, uh, but also alert you to some of her prior work on item development uh, with other co-authors from Lancaster University and beyond. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is move to Dylan Burton. He is gonna be introducing Dr. Rossi. So we have many connections with Lancaster University, also through several of our graduate students here at Michigan State who got their MA in language testing at Lancaster. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan to do the official introduction. Thank you, Paula. And uh, thanks everyone for, for coming. It looks like we've got about 67 people in the room, which is a really spectacular turnout so far. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to introduce Elena very briefly here. Elena just finished her PhD recently um, at Lancaster University. She was one of uh, Tinika Brunfeldt's uh, students. And um, I've had the privilege of knowing Elena now for, for quite a number of years. Um, Elena and I both uh, worked at the British Council uh, working for IELTS. And when I met Elena, I was doing my master's degree. And, um, she actually developed the item writing training program that you read about in this in this article for the cohort of IELTS examiners. And um, I was one of the lucky individuals that got to be trained by Elena. Um, the program lasted for several weeks. Really fantastic program, uh, thorough, well thought out, um, and really, really useful. I learned so much as an item writer. Other individuals in the cohort went on to become official item writers for Aptis and others uh, now lead production lines of item writers um, in the UK and also in continental Europe. Um, so Elena today has put together a really interesting uh, talk that's based on her own research, but it has important practical implications for people in the field. And um, we're just very, very lucky to have her. I think she's a great speaker and she's got a lot of interesting things to say. So without further ado, I'm gonna give the floor over to Elena. Thank you very much, Dylan. I hope I, my presentation lives up to your introduction. Now I will try to share the screen. Right, so the, today's presentation is about text authenticity and listening assessment. Uh, I wouldn't want to, so I wouldn't want to talk about uh, what I've already written in the article because uh, I hope that some of you at least have read it and those who haven't read it, you will be able to go and read it if you're interested after this presentation. So what I wanted to do today, because it's a workshop, I wanted to encourage discussion and experience sharing among you uh, who are interested in language testing, are language testing professionals, uh, professionals in producing language tests, um, to encourage discussion, experience sharing on the issue of text authenticity in listening assessment. Just from the start, I'd like to give a couple of acknowledgements. So first, I'd like to say that the article that we sent to you and asked you to read uh, was co-authored with Professor Tinika Brunfo, and I'm really grateful to her for uh, 
co-author in this article with me, and she was also my uh, doctoral studies supervisor. I'd also like to say thank you to the British Council and especially the East Asia Assessment Solutions team, who asked me to develop the item writing training course and who then allowed me to open up all this information to the public, because as we know, very often this is proprietary information. That's why we don't know that much about how item writing, operational item writing happens. So this is that rare course, um, rare case when we actually able to get insights and open it to the public. And of course, I'd like to say thank you to Paula, Dan and Dylan for making this workshop happen and for, for inviting me here. Um, they, I hope there will be a lot of communication during the workshop. I will invite you to ask questions and I hope to be able to answer your questions. And also we're going to be working in breakout rooms two times during the workshop. So Dylan and Paula will, will manage that and uh, I hope there will be productive discussion during that time. So just to start, um, to start the workshop, I'd like to throw out uh, probably a controversial statement. Um, Everyone now agrees or most people think that authenticity in, list in assessment is very, very important. But what we're trying to argue in this article is that sometimes the notions of being genuine and being authentic are mixed up. Um, but while we take up the understanding of this dichotomy that was um, started by, by Widowson. So genuine text is a text that was produced not for the testing purposes, that was produced for real life purposes. And then it follows that it has spoken language characteristics. And it is often assumed that such texts are the best choice for, for listening assessment because they have face validity, because um, they possess spoken language characteristics. It assumed that they have construct validity and, and many other things. However, when we look at it in a bit more detail, we can see that such texts are not, not always, and I can even say probably not often, really suitable for, for using in, uh, in, te in tests. Why does that happen? So first, we think that if we take a genuine text and we transfer it in, into the test, it keeps its its authenticity. But we would argue that these texts, they lose their authenticity when they're used in a test because they are not used in the, in the intended context, because they, they are not used with the intended audience. Um, they are not used for their original purpose. So all authenticity except the spoken language features is, is lost in this situation. And we can't really say that, that, that they are still authentic. And very often in, in real life spoken events, there is no task that follows the, the um, listening event. So when we try to add a task to such kind of task, it also inauthenticates them. Another argument is that such genuine texts, they might not always lend themselves to item generation because they're taken out of context. And if they're taken out of context, they lack clarity, they lack specificity. For example, if, if we take part of a conversation that, was, that happened between two people, those people have a background of relationship. They know what they were talking before that. And if we just take a little part, the test takers won't know what is actually happening in that conversation. Such um, genuine texts are often loosely structured and they have low information density. So they don't lend themselves to, um, to creating many items based, based on them. And if we want to create parallel test versions, such genuine texts, they might not allow for the creation of parallel uh, test versions because, uh, because of their uncontrolled variation. That's a phrase coined by Tony, Tony Green. Uh, so what is the solution? As we pose in the article, we think that taking genuineness for authenticity um, may, may not be the right approach. So we argue that text authenticity lies in the text that are perceived um, to reflect real life purposes. So this is so-called situational authenticity and that have spoken language characteristics irrespective of their origins. They might be genuine, they might be produced specifically for the testing purpose, but if they are perceived as authentic, they can be called authentic sounding. This is the term that we use for them. 
Um, so how can such authentic sounding texts be produced? How, how do they come to be in, in the literature? There are four, um, four techniques that they have been described. So first technique is adapting genuine text. This is when item writers choose um, genuine sound files, transcribe them, and then they adjust or, or doctor them with those sense phrase to uh, make them fit the specifications. Uh, another technique is so-called authenticating scripted text. So we know very often um, listening input texts are just scripted. So item writers just, just sit down and write such a text. Uh, well, Wagner suggested a way how to make them sound more authentic. So he called it authentication, is that when we take the script and then we fill the script with spoken language features. So for example, we add pauses, hesitations, back channeling, and other features of spoken language. Another way of producing authentic techniques suggested is semi-scripting. It was first suggested by Bach, um, and uh, he, he said that we can create content points, and then we can ask voice actors, or whoever records that, um, that text, to speak from the content points, but without reading the actual text. So the words are there, only the content has been um, given to them. And the last technique, it was suggested by Field, it's called improvisation or improvising. It's when the voice actors are given the situation and they are given the roles and then they, they come up with whatever text happens. Um, there are drawbacks in each of these techniques. For example, when item writers start adapting genuine texts, they start thinking more about the specifications, they forget about authenticity, so the text loses the authentic, uh, the features of spoken language as, as a result. Authenticating scripted te text, although it seems the easiest approach, uh, even Wenga, who introduced it, he admitted that we can add some spoken language features, but not all of them. For example, discursive features or the organizational features of the text are hardly possible to replicate when we use authentication. Um, in terms of semi-scripting, uh, if we ask to produce such a text by lay people who are not familiar with the specifications, the resulting text might not fit the specification requirements other than the authenticity of the input text. The same happened with improvisation, but another added minus of the imp improvisation technique is uh, that the resulting text, because it's so loosely based only on on the, it, it's a role play, and we don't know what will really be created as a result of it, um, it might not have enough content points or in that, that then enough information that that can be targeted in items. So, but whatever technique we take, these techniques depend in the final count on the item writers. Whether the item writers are able to use this technique, they have enough skill to, to use this, uh, any of these techniques, then to produce a listening input text that would sound authentic. And at this point, I would like to ask for your opinion. If you've read the article, please do not give the opinion that's given in the article. Please give your own genuine opinion, the one that you had, the, that you had originally. For that, uh, I would like to conduct a brief Paul can I ask you to go to this website, menti.com, and can I ask you to enter this code? Uh, there will be a multiple choice question, and you, please, can you, uh, please vote, and you can choose more than one option, and then we will see the results of your vote. The voting is, is anonymous, and we'll just see the general trend. Wow, the opinions are really divided. I can see that most people have voted now. It is so interesting. Thank you very much. This is really getting insights in, into the field. So we have only seven people who think that we can't do it, but probably it is predictable. So if people, those people who think that it's not possible to be done, they wouldn't come to this workshop in the first place. 
Um, but um, so people, 22 people think that's possible by 24 by adapting genuine text, 26 that it's possible to do through authenticating texts. And the same number of people think that we can produce authentic sound and text through semi-scripting. Then 15 through improvisation and five people think that it's possible to do it through a technique not listed here. I wonder what technique that is. So would be great those people who have done it, would be great if you could share this technique in your breakout room if it is possible. Okay, thank you very much. That was really, really insightful. And, uh, and now uh, Paula and Dylan will move you into the breakout rooms. It will be a very brief activity where I will ask you to just to introduce yourself. You will work in groups of five. Could you introduce yourself and discuss the poll results? So whether you were surprised what you think about the question. And if you have any experience with producing listening input text and you would like to share this experience, please do that as well. And in five minutes, we will ask you to come back to the main room. Okay, so I'll be putting you into um, breakout rooms. There'll be about four to five people per room, 15 breakout rooms. And you've been invited, so you can join your room. So I think everyone is back, Elena, from the breakout rooms. And thank you very much for a very productive discussion. I joined one group and uh, I think there is this, I saw, I heard in that group something that um, creates a divide between operational language testers and language testers testing academics. Because in the academic field, I hear very often that we should not use anything except genuine text while people in our, in our group said that, um, that's why I was very much surprised that only five people saw that item writers cannot create authentic sound and text. Um, I, I expected there might be more people. Um, so what I'm going to talk now for a little while is about the study findings in relation to their implications for the operational item writing item writer training and item production. So I, I won't just, again, you've read the article, so I won't just enumerate the findings. I will speak about what these findings mean for item writing and item writing training. So the study showed that training is generally beneficial in, de in developing trainees' ability to produce authentic sound and text. I say generally because one third of item writers were able to produce authentic, fully authentic sound and text, but two thirds still had a way to go until their text uh, th sounded fully authentic. Um, this shows that trainees might need more item writing practice and feedback for, for this skill uh, to fully develop. And I mean, the implication here for item writing training that probably it's unrealistic and maybe even unwise to expect immediate excellent results from any item writing training. We know that item writing is a complex cognitive skill and complex, complex cognitive skills, they don't, they don't develop fast. There is, I even read about a 10 year rule when one comes from, a, develops from a novice in, into a um, complete mastery. So when we train item writers and after a week or two we expect them to produce perfect text, no, this will not happen. Or this will happen only with, with a very small amount of, of item writers. So, but it shows still that training is beneficial because some people were able to fully develop their, um, this uh, skill. And for some, for most people, for the majority of people, their text improved in terms of their uh, authenticity. So the training was beneficial and judging from this and from what the trainees said, what should such training include? We can say that this training should include awareness raising uh, of the importance of authenticity because at the beginning of the training, not all trainees thought that it was even important for a text to sound authentic because it is in a test, so it, it's okay for it to sound stilted and inauthentic. 
um, they also should be taught differences between spoken and written language because we often sometimes we think that all oh, the oh, my item writer is a native speaker they uh, he or she communicates all the time uh, in English or in any and in the target language so they they know what what authentic uh, spoken features are no they don't or they don't pay attention they do know subconsciously but they don't pay attention to it and very and um, during that training item writers were surprised so one said or oh, redundancy I, I I don't hear redundancy in people's speech. There is a lot of it. They just don't notice it. So they should be explicitly taught spoken language characteristics. I think it's also beneficial to introduce techniques for producing authentic sound in text that work. But the thing is, we don't really, it's difficult to find in the literature some empirically proven technique that really works. And I think the study that, that we conducted, it, it probably helped a little bit towards, towards this goal to see which techniques work and which techniques don't work. And it's important during the training to have extensive item writing practice followed with feedback, not only tutor feedback, which is very important, but the, the training showed that peer feedback is also very, very important. Maybe the order should be item writing practice, then peer feedback, and then tutor feedback. But when we speak about, for example, training in spoken language features, what, what should that include? Um, I think it's important not just to give item writers, this is a list of spoken language features, make sure that your texts have it. I think it's important to focus on more challenging concepts. For example, it's easy for item writers to, to fill their text with pauses and hesitations, but what about discursive features? What about organizational features? This is something that's difficult to reproduce. Or when they use authentication technique, is it possible to reproduce at all? Um, also, the study showed that it's important for the item writers to develop not superficial but nuanced understanding of spoken language characteristics. For example, if all that they take from the training is that there is a list of spoken language features and they need to staff their text with the spoken language features, the text will be different. But they will still be, they still won't sound authentic. They would, will just sound inauthentically full of pauses, hesitations, and whatnot. So, for example, they need to, to be aware of such nuanced things that unfilled pauses in real, in natural speech, they occur in close boundaries and not anywhere. That repetitions occur at close beginnings and they can't just put them anywhere that they shouldn't um, use one type of features, for example, pauses, and they use loads and loads of them. They need to use wide range of features, but used appropriately and not excessively, because when they use excessively, the text uh, stops sounding authentic as well. Um, item writers also asked for examples, many examples of transcribed spoken texts in target genres. So if we ask them to write dialogue in a particular genre, then, then they should see the transcriptions of genuine texts in the same genre. And I think what is also important is uh, to train item writers in using language transcription conventions then they will be able to produce the text not as written text like an essay but when they produce this text it will look like a transcription of genuine text and then voice actors will be able to use it and reproduce all of these features um, i think the training in uh, uh, in the uh, text production techniques is also very important but we, we saw that there are four techniques um, that uh, have been suggested in the literature but do they all work or not it's interesting that using genuine text or even adapting genuine text was not attempted by any of the participants maybe tell us something about the use of genuine text actually that is so difficult that people didn't even want to adapt it a lot of people attempted uh, attempted authentication probably because it seems to be the um, the easiest technique but this technique doesn't seem to work at least in my experience i saw in the poll that a lot of you i think about 27 people said that authentication works um, according to our study at least it didn't work the um the text produced using authentication didn't sound authentic to the reviewers probably because it's not possible to reproduce more nuanced features of spoken language using authentication technique. Um, Semi-scripting seems to, br uh, to bring good results. It brought the best results in, in this study. And personally, I think that it can be recommended. 
um, improvisation didn't work, although it was attempted by only one item writer because the text didn't have enough, enough testable content. But again, I saw that some of you, although not many, and the, in our breakout room, the person who, who spoke said that they don't use improvisation because it requires very, very like nuanced skills that not everyone has. Interestingly, study resulted in two other techniques that might be considered. First was vocalization. It is similar to semi-scripting, but the item writers don't actually record themselves. They produce content points, and then they voice the text from these content points, simultaneously writing it down. So they hear it, and then they write it down. And it seemed to bring good results, at least in this study. Interestingly, there was another technique, which I never heard of, but I think it, it's very promising. It's a hybrid of um, genuine text adaptation and semi-scripting. So the item writer took a genuine text, generated content points from it for the content points to be, to be genuine as well, and then um, uh, follow with the semi-scripting technique to produce the text. I think this is a very promising technique and, and it, it is worth uh, further investigation. And the last point that I'd like to raise is the specifications and their influence on uh, tax authenticity. So many item writers, uh, sorry, many participants, trainees in the study, they felt and commented that when they wrote a text, it was either text authenticity or following other specification requirements. They said that in some, in some cases, the specification requirements precluded text authenticity. For example, they said that there is very strict requirement for vocabulary frequency, or especially requirement to incorporate distractors in the text. It didn't allow the text to, so to sound authentically spoken as they should be. So probably one lesson we can learn is that we need to find a balance between how strict the specification requirements are and if we want the text to sound authentic, maybe we need to find some balance there. We understand, I understand why specifications are what they are, but, but then they probably there is a way to, to, to balance it a bit better. Right, so that, that was all, very, very brief. I tried not to go into detail because I was hoping to, to have some questions from you. And I think this is the time when I will be very happy to take your questions if you have any. Would you like these verbally, Elena, or in the chat or both? Um, they, can, they can be verbally, that's fine. And I can see them in the chat too. So, Elena, hello. Yeah. Um, okay, hello, Hi. Um, I just wanted to have a, a little bit more clarification on the semi scripting because I'm not experienced with that. But mm -hmm. it so, when, when you mentioned semi scripting and voice actors, it sounded to me like it was a process that is similar to maybe scripting for a TV series or a movie. Uh, you have the dialogues that are created and people pull together their resources to come up with language that sounds authentic. Is that what it is? Because when we watch movies or series, a lot of what is spoken is scripted. It's not genuine because they are actors. Is, is that the idea or am I far off? Uh, thank, thank you, Liberato. You know, I don't know how, how TV series are produced, uh, but I, I know a little bit how items are produced. What I meant, um, um, I understand that when they produce films, there is a script writer who produces full script. And then the actors, they just read the script. I don't know how much they're allowed to improvise. I heard that some directors allow them to do it, some, some don't allow them to do it. Um, but what I meant by semi-scripting is that when the item writer comes up with content points, what this dialogue or what this text should, should contain, and then using these content points, but not having the exact words how that should be spoken just just speaks about this covering these content points uh, so what happens then uh, and there is there is a distinction here i heard two opinions first opinion is just give content points to the voice actors and then the voice actors will produce the text we record it as it is in the studio very fast done but 
I heard anecdotal evidence that when that was attempted by, by one item, right, by one company, they, they found that the items did not, um, did not comply with other specification requirements. Uh, so the recommendation in the literature and my recommendation as well is that this is done by the item writer. So the item writer produces content points, then the item writer records himself voice and this content co points produced in the text. Then the item writer transcribes himself or herself using transcription conventions. And then this transcription is checked by reviewers if they think it is fine, then it goes to voice actors and the voice actors look at it using transcription conventions and then they produce the final version in studio conditions. So that is what semi-scripting is as I understand it. But I also must say that the, um, terminology is very, very mixed up here. In different sources, they call semi-script in different sense. They call authentication different sense. So I'm just, uh, I am I'm saying how I understand them and how we're, we're using it in the article. And thank, thank you for the question, Liberato. I think I have a couple of other questions. The one from Margarita. Um, so she, she quotes um, our article, it's often taken for granted that native speakers or highly proficient speakers are familiar with spoken language features. Would you recommend non-native speakers as item writers? Well, I am not a native English speaker and I am a practicing item writer with nine years of experience. So, and, and I think, um, I also know that item writers specialize in different, in different items. So some people like doing reading, some listening. Personally, I think I'm much better at listening than at reading. I don't know why it happens. So yeah, I, I, as long as a person is proficient in the language, it doesn't matter whether the person is native speaker or not. I think there's a question from uh, Rachel. What is the impact of voice talent on authenticity of a listening item? Uh, Rachel, could you clarify what you mean by voice talent? Because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to misinterpret your question if possible. Do you mean ear for the spoken text or do you mean the voice talent as a talent, uh, as a voice actor? Are the people that record, ah, you mean, thank you. So this is the voice actors. I think that a lot uh, depends on how the item is finally recorded. Even if the item writer produced a very nice script uh, which could be authentic sounding, but then it is given in the hands of, of incapable voice actors, then they, they can spoil it definitely. So I think it is, it is important. But then I think it's a matter that's a bit different from item writing. So this is, moves into production of the item, the recording stage. But of course, talent is important everywhere. Um, I can see a question from Nancy Powers. It seems as though the way people listen has become more visual over the past several years. I'm interested in your opinion on the impact of using videos on authenticity. Um, if you don't mind, I wouldn't go into this topic because using audio scripts and video scripts is such a debatable topic. And there, there have been a lot that produced on it recently. You can look at the work of Aaron Batty, for example, who also recently graduated from Lancaster University. Um, he has an opinion about that as well. I more or less agree with that opinion, but um, yeah. I don't think I'll go into it here if you don't mind. Uh, D. Jasperson, when starting with content points, is it possible then to make the items before the text is finally scripted? Mm. I don't think I understand this question. Is it possible to make the, it's possible to make the content points then produce the item I'm not sure I understand the text. Maybe if you clarify, D, then I will be happy to answer it. Sorry if my question isn't clear. Um, it's because I'm wondering, it's difficult to produce the distractors. Uh, is, is it possible to, when you, you use a semi-scripting um, semi technique, if you start uh, by having the points, is it possible then to make the items directly 
um, matching the points and then scripting the text afterwards. I was just wondering if if we always have to produce the items afterwards. That's that's what my question is about. I hope it's clear now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you ask it about destructors, I think we can include destructors into the content points. So for example, we include in the content points that we need to mention several um, train times or whatever. Uh, yeah, so that, that's possible to do with the content points. The, okay, so- Can, can I, can I um, jump in? On that yes. point, the, the specifications for items often call for uh, particular item types. You know, you need a main idea question, you need an inference question, you need a detail question. So you need to have the speaker imply something, for example. So is that actually authentic? How often do we imply things, really? You know, I mean, if you, if most people say what they mean, they don't just you know, imply things like, did, did you understand what I meant there? <laughs> yeah, I think this is a bit different from, now we go into the production of items, you know, not production of text, but of course they reflect on the production of items. You're right, I think, but what we need to do, people do imply in their, in their text, uh, I mean, in, in what they say. Oh, I mean, it's, it's not like it's unheard of that pe people never imply in their speech, but I think then we need to choose the situation. So this is about situational authenticity in which a person would naturally imply something. We need to choose if we need to check the like the general understanding, then we need to choose a text that lends itself to the genre that lends itself well to, well to it. If we if we want to check some um, specific points, that we need to choose the genre where people give a lot of uh, a lot of pieces of specific information. So I think this is more about situational authenticity. I would say than about spoken language characteristics. Does that answer your question? I can see another question here. Um, uh, I think this is Sar Sarah, two questions. No, three questions, right? Um, please, Dylan and Paula, tell me when, when the time's up because I can see the clock on my screen. So Monique is asking, Aaron Oroge made a point earlier about authenticity to whom? In my experience, this plays out in conversations among item writers and test development project supervisors when they discuss passages and items during uh, passages and items during review and revision. In this case, what is authentic is decided on by the project group. What are your thoughts on who decides what is authentic? I do agree with this. Yeah, so we have an item writer uh, who, who thinks that they heard uh, this, for example, in, in terms of situational authenticity, especially for this item writer, this is an authentic situation, and then the item reviewers say, no, this is not authentic situation. As an item writer, I, I always agree with item reviewers, I don't argue with them, uh, but I just, if they want me to, to change something, I change it. If they scrap my item, I don't complain, uh, but um, I think don't even know how, how to, to answer your question. Yeah, that is why I think authenticity is often understood as genuineness. So people think that the, if this is a real life text, that it wasn't produced for testing purposes, then it is so-called authentic or it is genuine. Well, I am arguing that this is not true. So in my study, the people who judged whether the, the text sounded authentic, they were item reviewers. There were three item reviewers. So in the final count, there must be someone who will judge whether it's authentic or not. And hopefully these will be people who, who make the right decision. Yeah. Um, there are questions from Sarah and from Sheila. Yeah, so Dylan, is that the last question or can I take another? I think these will be the last one. So these are good points that they make, but maybe we should move on. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you for your questions. At the end, I hope there will be a bit of time when I'll be able to take to take more questions. Um, and now what we wanted you to do, I hope we've given you enough food for, for thought and for discussion. We'd like you to work in breakout rooms again. And they will be a collaborative task now. And in this collaborative task, we will ask you to use, uh, we will ask you to produce item or writing recommendations uh, on how to train or how to develop item writing skills to create authentic sound and listening input texts. And this recommendation should not only concern initial item writing training, but they should look into the long-term support of item writers as well beyond the initial training. Um, the recommendations may include, but don't have to be limited to the suggestions that resulted from our study, if you think that they're worth following. If you don't think they're worth following, it's absolutely fine. Maybe you have some other suggestions that work in, worked in your context, or you think they will work. Or maybe you think there are some alternative solutions to um, item writer training of how to, to produce authentic sound in text. This is fine as well. Um, uh, the recommendations can be more general, or they can be targeted at your institution if you'd like to speak about your local context, for example, about your test. Um, you'll have 10 minutes for that. And uh, you have 10 minutes for that. And you will use Jamboard to produce the recommendations. Just very, very quickly, I'll give you instructions on how to use Jamboard. Um, when you go into your break into your breakout room, please look in the chat and there you will see a link to the collaborative whiteboard in uh, Jamboard. Click on the link and then you will enter the Jamboard. When you enter the Jamboard, um, you, there, in each Jamboard there will be four breakout rooms. So for example, here there are breakout rooms from one to four. Um, Please find your board. So for example, if you are in the breakout room from one to four and your room is number two, please scroll here at the top until you find breakout room number two. If you're not sure what breakout room you're in, please look at the top of your screen. It says here something like Zoom, room six or room five, whatever your room you are in. When you are uh, using this Jamboard, it's very, very easy and intuitive. On the left, you will see this panel. And in this panel, you can use sticky notes. So for example, I used the sticky note to produce a test message here, or you can use this as a text box. If you click on this text box, then you will produce text similar to the one that, that you can see here at the top. Um, Paula will now move you into the breakout rooms. Please look at the chat click on the link and work in your breakout room to produce a recommendation. Correct. Dylan has put into the chat what we're calling the hallway. So you'll see those links now in the chat room for the breakouts, but wait and I will put you in your rooms. And you've been invited to join a room and then you'll go to the jam board that corresponds with your room number. Okay. Everybody is filing back in. Thank you very much for working in the groups. And we were, Dylan and me, we were like peeping into different breakout rooms. So I'll just show a couple of breakout rooms um, where there were some interesting comments. I'll share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Moment, I think everybody is almost back, Alina. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm sharing my screen now. Hope you can see it. Um, so in breakout room, there were some very interesting comments. Um, so they said that peer feedback is important and also peer group to support item writing training and feedback. I think this is very important. This is something that should continue beyond the initial training. This is something that we call community of practice and this community of practice should be built and encouraged um, in, in any organization that employs item writers. But they had also some other comments like we need to use face-to-face -face item writing training component or at least a hybrid. That is very interesting. Um, 
Yeah, because I mean, in my own opinion, it is so difficult to organize a face to face item writing training. So I prefer it online. And I feel that it is possible to build a community of practice, even when, when we teach, um, when we train item writers online. And we do a lot of things online these days anyway. Uh, yeah, but it's interesting that, that you think in your context it might not work. Um, there was another. Um, let me see. There was another room in room five. There were some very interesting comments like have item writers analyzed these course features of different target language genres. This is so, so true. And I, I really support that. I think it's, it's very important to, to have item writers notice and realize and become aware and analyze so that they were able to, to reproduce these features. Sometimes it doesn't work like giving them a list and say, so that's what, what you need to put in. But when they notice, then they will probably be better able to reproduce something by themselves. Um, so what else was interesting here? To set up a process which allows item writers to discuss and review their texts. So again, like set up an item, item production cycle that would include peer review, as I understand it. I think this, this is a very, very good comment, really. There, there are lo loads of good comments in every room, I must say. Um, there was another one in breakout room 10, study patterns in authentic transcribed text that create original text using those patterns of speech and interaction. As, I think it's something similar with the breakout room five. So we need to notice and we need to study the genuine text then to be able to reproduce it. Raise awareness in terms of genre. Yes, I think it's also very important because another question we can ask, so there was a question uh, authentic to whom, but also the question authentic in what situation, authentic for what genre. So we can fill a text with authentic um, like speech uh, features of spoken language, but will they be inherent to, to, to that particular genre? Uh, and they also recommend semi-scripting, but they give a challenge. Item writers are not always experts on the topics. For example, language for specific purposes. I do agree with that as well. And there was one study by Clark. What they did, they used um, uh, lecturers who were specialists in the topic. They asked them to create content points and they, re they recorded the lectures. But again, those lecturers, they're not um, they are not specialists in item writing then, so maybe those texts didn't conform to other specifications. I think there is a conundrum here. But I also think that what can help here maybe is that hybrid approach that was reported by one item writer in, in our study. So when that item writer used genuine text, created content points from their genuine text, uh, so, so that those are genuine content points, but then recorded the text um, conforming it to the specifications. I think I think this is a good idea. Might might be worth further investigation. Thank you very much for working in in your groups, and Dylan. If I have if I have a bit of time to answer a bit more some more questions, I will be happy to do that before we finish. Is there any time? Um, yeah, we've got uh, five minutes at least that we can use to take some questions. Yeah, so if you would like to ask any any questions within those five minutes or post them in the chat, I'll be happy to answer if I can. I'll ask a quick question just to get it kicked off. Um, so when we were talking in this case in, in breakout room 10 about, um, about these authentic transcribed texts um, stud based on patterns and interactions, you know, in applied linguistics, there's um, there's a large tradition of studying interactions and patterns using conversation analysis. Elena, do you think there'd be any value in training item writers of listening texts um, to maybe transcribe authentic interactions using CA, at least as exemplars so that they could go on to, to use that in their practice? Yes, I, I think there is a lot of value in that. And, uh, when item writers have to produce dialogues or conversations, of, of course, this will make them aware of, of the features of genuine conversations, definitely. But I think as, as also we discussed it, 
there are a lot of things that item writers would benefit from learning, from learning spoken language features, conversation analysis, transcribing spoken texts, and, and a lot of other things. But when it comes to operational constraints, the <laughs> test development managers often think that, no, we don't have money for that. We don't have time for that. We just want people who are able to produce items, you know. So maybe if studies like this, like, like the one that we conducted, and maybe there will be more, hopefully, they will raise awareness that the training, this training works and it can be effective and that people are not born item writers that can be made item writers through training. And everyone knows that it's so, so difficult to recruit a really good item writer. So maybe then they will start investing more in their stuff and, and they will be more good item writers. And as a result, there will be more good tests. Yeah, thanks. Those are and the operational constraints, I'm sure is the biggest thing. You know, one one day um, AI will be good enough that all item writers will be out of work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, now it's not. What will happen in the future? No one knows. But still, now we are still in work. That's. Um, I was wondering about um, what Dylan just mentioned about having item writers transcribe uh, authentic text. Uh, we were actually talking about that in our group as well. Um, and I was wondering in that context, um, in your article, you mentioned that the trainees were also provided with transcript examples, and I was wondering where where you got those from. Was it from? Did you use specific uh, spoken language corpora, for example, or something like that? Um, I we didn't write, you know, um, in the article that we provided them with uh, transcripts. I think what we wrote is that uh, trainees asked to be provided with oh, those okay. transcripts. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, it, it's it's easy to misinterpret. Yeah, um, but I think that was the one lesson that we learned actually from that training. And if I did that that training again, I mean, if I told the next cohort, there are loads of things that I would have done differently. And one thing that I I would do differently is to provide them with it, uh, with the transcribed texts, where I would take them from. Yeah, this is another question. Then I would start thinking about that. But of of course, I would try to find something that is representative of the target language used domain, what, whatever whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and think, another thing. Sorry, yes, Lisa. Yes, uh, I was just gonna say I think that. Certain uh, language corpora may be a good idea to to go looking into there because it's uh, it's very re revealing to actually see a text transcribed in that fashion where you can see overlaps, all the pauses, even with duration of pauses and stuff like that. Absolutely, I agree with you. I really, really agree with you here, and even more so, I think. Um, like making item writers acquainted with, with corpora and how to work with corpora and how to generate items using corpora is, is very important. Like uh, I think in the last or two years ago at the last uh, LTRC, we had a workshop on, on using corpora in, in item generation and that was really fascinating um, workshop to attend. So that's another thing. <laughs> I don't write this need to learn conversation analysis and they, they also need, need to learn corpora. But I do think that, that corpora um, has, has a long have a long way to go in, in terms of item writing and that, that will be happening more. That is a perfect segue to Elena to our last slide. So um, we're out of time. The workshop is to end at 1245. We want to say thank you if everyone will join me in thanking Dr. Rossi in doing this workshop. We're thrilled to have her, thrilled to get to know her more, and we can't wait to see more of her work. Uh, it's item writing is, is at the heart of what we do. Thank you everyone to coming. Dan Reed and I were thrilled uh, to see everyone. And we all hope that we will see you at one of the upcoming conferences. So we listed a few of them here. I know Dylan, Kuhn, Dan, and Elena, and many of us will be traveling to some of these. They're virtual, so they're easy to attend. And um, stay in touch, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you for participating. It was really 
very interesting for me as well to know your opinions and and see uh, your conversations. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.